Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are, whatever time zone you are in. I welcome you on my session on this year's .NETOS conference. My name is Yiri Chinchura and today I will be talking about what I did and how I am actually putting the .NET runtime into the Firebird database engine. <clears throat> if you want, you can follow me on Twitter. You can see the handle on, uh, on the screen. And if you want to read about all my different .NET crazy stuff that I'm doing, uh, you can also follow me on the tabsoverspaces.com. Uh, also, uh, a little information. I'm talking to you from the future. No, actually from the history because uh, something unexpected popped up and I need to pre-record my session. Uh, but I will be, or at least try to be with you on the chat and answer all the questions you have in the chat. Uh, I will be using my phone. Uh, so hopefully I will be able to answer all your questions. So without any further ado, let's jump into it. So what I mean that I put .NET into the Firebird engine? Well, it's easy to show you what I mean. I have here basically an empty uh, virtual machine and I will start a Visual Studio. And inside the Visual Studio, I will create a simple console application, sorry, not console application, class library. And I will create a simple function. So let's say C Sharp and I want the library. So there's a class library. Let's call it .NETOS and let's create it. .NET standard 2.0 is fine for me. And what I will do is create a simple, uh, a simple code that I can actually, uh, that I can actually use to show you what I mean. So let's create a class demo. Let me make it a little bit bigger so both you and me can read it. So I will create public static class demo, public static i enumerator. collections generic there it is and i will return a value tuple of int and int and let's call it uh, hello and i will take integer as the parameter so what i will do is a simple for loop from well maybe call it um x not i and let's do this var because it triggers my OCD and I will do just simple yield return and I will return I and I really stupidly simple piece of code public static uh, I think I made a mistake I need to return this one then nullable because everything in database can be eventually nullable so even though my integers need to be nullable and I will just build this one so fingers crossed everything is fine uh, i think it is so i'll open my folder and there is my dll so i will take this dll and put it into this firebird uh, installation directory so there is a plugins and my plugin is in the folder called fb net external engine so i will copy paste my dll there let's minimize this one and let's open the console so let's do into desktop firebird and let's start the firebird the nice thing about the firebird which by the way is a normal database engine as you probably know microsoft sql server postgres mysql uh, oracle db2 and so on and so on many others and it even has an embedded feature uh, so it works more like sql lite so you don't have to start server open ports and so on and one nice Thing about the server is that you can actually run it as an application great way for debugging and testing different versions and so on so the dash a means I'm starting as an application not as a as a server in terms of like Windows service so let me start this one it's running and let me uh, let me do isql user is sysdba that's the default user and usually the default password if it's on your local machine uh, is master key. It's kind of a historical one. You can obviously, or and you should obviously select a different one. So let me create a database. Uh, create database, localhost, test.fdb, for example. There it is. <clears throat> and what I can do is define uh, our function 
like this one. So I will create a procedure that will be called hello, for example. Uh, it takes one integer parameter as an input and returns two uh, output parameters, which matches what we have. We are returning two output parameters, the names does not matter. This is the name. So it says, hey, it will be in the .NETOS assembly. The namespace is .NETOS demo and the name is hello. Well, it's selecting the whole thing. It's hello. And I use this uh, so-called engine to execute this one. So let's copy paste this one, paste it here. And something is not quite right. Oh, there are two Firebird servers running. Not sure why this, but that's a mistake. So let me start the Firebird server again, connect again, and uh, connect to the existing database. Great. Let's copy paste. Let's copy paste this one again. There it is. Now it works. And what we can do is actually select star from um, hello and say uh, 10, for example, some arbitrary number. So if I run it, you will see that I get two results back from zero to nine because that's the simple for loop uh, that I have. <clears throat> uh, so if I do like, uh, I don't know, 50, then I will obviously get all the way to 49 from zero to 49. That's um, what my plugin is actually doing. You can have store procedures, you can have functions. For function, obviously you have only one return type. There is no, uh, no enumeration, nothing like that because it's not returning a result set, but it's the same concept to get some inputs. And in terms of function, you return one value. So that's what it is. And that's what I'm actually doing. Let's start with a simple prerequisites. First of all, this is not my full time job. I'm not working full time on this one. Uh, so sometimes the progress is slow. Uh, sometimes uh, it takes me quite some time to implement something or to figure something out. Uh, so you might be saying, hey, I know this one or I would do this differently or something like this. Yes, absolutely. It makes sense. And I agree with you. Uh, then it's work in progress. It's not finished product. I'm still working on it if I have time and I have a lot of stuff uh, that I'm thinking about for future versions. So it's not finished product and there is still a lot of room for improvement. And finally, uh, the performance has its mostly support costs. What I mean is that I know I can make it way faster. That's not a question. The problem is that when somebody uh, reports me an issue, uh, <clears throat> I need to be able to debug it, to understand what's happening. And I don't want to shoot myself into the light. I can do everything in, in unsafe code, in, in C sharp unsafe and, and fiddle pointers left and right. But then what's the benefit of having a garbage collector and what's the benefit of having, of having type safety and so on. So there's always a balance between um, providing absolutely totally bonkers performance and being able to debug it. Because when I do something really wrong in the plugin, I can crash the Firebird server because the plugin is running inside the same uh, executable, inside the same address space as the Firebird server. And in my world, I would trade, I don't know, 5% of the performance for server stability uh, compared to a plus 5% of performance and sometimes somehow the server crashing, even though you can immediately restart it and something like that. That's, that's worst case in my world. So a little bit about how it started. Um, I think it was like 2016 or something. I was working for a customer in this area. Uh, I'm from Czech Republic, but as you can guess, this one is on the a border of Slovakia and, and Poland. Uh, and I was in a, in a small, a small hotel and it was off season and I came a little bit late. So just, they just gave me the keys and basic information like breakfast and other stuff. And I forgot to ask, or maybe I, I didn't remember the Wi-Fi password. So for the next three and a half days or maybe four days, I was stuck there, uh, with basically nothing to do. It was off season. I think it was even raining. So there was not much to do outside, even though the nature around looked nice. Um, so I decided, hey, I will explore this concept that the Fiber 3 introduced at the time that was called external engines. And the external engines is basically a plugin that will get some information and return some information, some data, either a function, store, procedure or a trigger. 
the good news is that I had something to uh, occupy myself for the next uh, three days in the evenings and afternoons when I was not working for the customer. And the problem was that I did not have Wi-Fi, uh, but it was kind of nice because <clears throat> the only way to make something was figure it out. There was no like, hey, I will try to Google it. Maybe somebody did something or maybe I will find some documentation or something like, no, I was completely offline. So I just had my Visual Studio, just my compiler and I started to figure something out. Funny story before um, I made it kind of like an official uh, useful plugin. Uh, I call it Yiri plugin because um, it was just a fun project that I was basically trying to um, occupy myself with and kind of like can it be done? Would it work? Uh, so that was the original name. So it started on the .NET framework 4.52, quite a long, uh, a long version uh, back. There was a lot of reflection initially just to make it work. Uh, so it was really, really slow. Uh, originally it was using tuple, as you saw with my demo. Now I'm using the value tuples because of the syntax, uh, syntax support. Uh, originally in .NET 4.5, we did not have tuple or uh, the value tuple or even syntax support. And I was loading a lot of stuff using directly the assembly load prompt. So quite slow, um, but it was working. That was the, the first, um, first goal of me, like make it work. <clears throat> so to give you a little bit of understanding how it works, there is an argument class or, or I, have an, I have an argument class uh, in, in my code. And Firebird, when it calls a function or calls a procedure, it basically gives you what's the name of the function or the procedure. That's the string you have in the declaration with the exclamation point and gives you a pointer uh, where the values are and a little bit of description like what's the type, what's the offset of the next value, what's the length and so on. So I basically get a pointer, uh, which is block of memory. I don't know how, how long it is. Well, I can compute it, but I don't know how long it is. And the first argument is here. The second is here. The third one is here and so on. So I get these offsets and depending on what type of argument it is, I can read the memory. So it might be a double, it might be integer, it might be uh, date time, it might be something like that. And I just need to read it and interpret it because for example, the date time is represented slightly differently in Firebird than it's represented in the, in the .NET. The integer is the same on both sides. So that's pretty, pretty easy. <clears throat> So that's the two informations that I get from the Firebird. Uh, and obviously I need to return back some result, which is again the same. I will return, hey, this is the result and this is the description of the result or actually Firebird knows what's the description of the result. So I just need to put it correctly into the memory. If I'm returning two integers, I need to put it in correct place and so on. And I return, hey, you will find it at this place in the memory and Firebird will then return it to the engine and engine does something with it like filtering and, and whatnot. So that's basically how it works and, and how, it, how it started. The first one is that, as you can probably guess, if I am always loading the assemblies from the disk, that's really slow. Uh, so it makes sense to actually have some cache. Uh, so I started using the concurrent dictionary for this caching and quickly you will realize uh, that this is, this is not the best idea. It's, uh, it's something that's well known, uh, but the, the function factory the, the, the method that's actually loading the assembly is not guaranteed by the concurrent dictionary to be called only once. It's just, uh, it's in the documentation. And if you have concurrent access for a new one, uh, the function can be called multiple times, which obviously is something you don't want. So uh, you end up with something like lazy of assembly and the lazy uh, has a threat safety mode enum where you can specify whether it's a threat safe for execution and publication or only publication. So you can have that one. Uh, then obviously I switched to value tuple because uh, with the C sharp seven, we had this nice syntax sugar. Uh, in my opinion, it, it, it looks and feels okay to have this kind of like interface between SQL where you have like these, these rows with columns and the tuple in the Firebird, uh, sorry, not the tuple in the C sharp. Uh, the problem is uh, that uh, for it to work, I basically need to know what is the size of the tuple, what are the types inside the tuple, and I need to be able to access it dynamically using some kind of indexer or something like that. I don't know how big the tuple will be because um, obviously you can create any tuple you want. So there was a, there was a lot of reflection code uh, to make it work. Let me jump into a code and show you what I mean. One thing that you might find uh, 
surprising is that if I create this tuple that has, if I'm not mistaken, 14 character, uh, 14 uh, items, and you ask, hey, what's the type and what are the generic arguments? Basically, what is the value tuple uh, T1, T2, and so on? What are these generic arguments? And in my case, what's the length? You will get, yes, you guessed it, you will get number eight. There it is. Although the tuple uh, has 14 items. The reason is that although you can use this nice syntax sugar in the C-sharp compiler, uh, the value tuple itself has only eight possible options, uh, while the last one is called T rest, which is used for nesting the tuples inside. So if you if you have like 14, uh, 14 uh, items in the tuple, you have uh, seven items and the eighth one is basically a next tuple that's nested into into the, the top one and so on so um so that's kind of not nice because you need to be able to uh like dynamically uh, and recursively get the length or get the number number of types so this is actually a piece of code that i put uh from like old code of this plugin where i have uh the the um requesting the types of the tuple, so it isn't a type, so I also know the length of the tuple, and it basically says, hey, if it's longer than, than eight, uh, well, actually longer than seven parameters, then you need to recursively call the get tuple and get it from the, from the last one. Same if you want to get a value dynamically from a tuple, so this is something that was in the plugin uh, before as well. So I, I get an index and the tuple itself, you can see it's an object. There is no, uh, there was no common way to pass any tuple of any type. Uh, and again, this, the, the same stuff. If it's more than seven, uh, then I call the rest. The field is called rest and get the next one. If not, then I will just do item one, item two, item three, and so on, and get the value back. So that's uh, something you will quickly learn that the tuples are not really that nice. Uh, they are nice to create, they are not nice to uh, dynamically consume. And at the time, <clears throat> with the first uh, version of value tuples, there was no common type for to be used uh, with the tuples. So if you needed to accept basically any tuple of any size, of any type, uh, there was no way you needed to do the object the same way I did it, which kind of sucks because the value tuple is a value type. If you do object, you will have a, a boxing. But uh, in .NET 4.7.1 and on, even in .NET Core, uh, they created a I tuple interface. So again, let's jump into this one. There is it. Uh, the iTuple interface lives in system runtime compiler services. So it's not a normal type. It's, it's usually for like a compiler stuff. And this one gives you two really nice properties. It gives you the length. That's what I'm using in my demo code and also gives you the indexer that allows you to access dynamically the pieces of the tuple uh, directly and you don't have to do this reflection stuff and nesting and, and recursion and all this stuff. So that's really, really nice because that means you can access uh, the length of the tuple even though it's like multiple tuples nested into each other uh, using this interface. And if you, have a, uh, if you have a function that can accept basically any tuple <clears throat> and you, you don't care, for example, you can then serialize it into JSON or something, I don't know. You can just use the iTuple interface. It kind of, it's kind of weird that the tuple interface itself is in the compiler services. Uh, it would make sense to at least for me to have it in the system because it it, it looks like a uh, fairly um, useful um, useful interface. So same as the value tuple is in the system, then the iTuple could be in the uh, system as well, but it's in the compiler services. But if you need it anytime, you can find it there and you can use it. It's really, really nice interface. So then, as I was talking with a bunch of friends that are using the Firebird and using the .NET and so on, somebody came up with a really great idea. What if we would be able to do hot reload, basically hot swap assemblies while the server is running? Really, really great idea. So basically you have a Firebird server running and you can drop in the new version of your DLL. And once you drop it in, the plugin should be able to reload it uh, and, uh, and use it. Great idea. Uh, really shitty way to do it. Uh, so sometimes as a fan, I'm saying, hey, uh, the .NET 6 is all about the hot reload and, and other stuff. I did this 
for the Firebird like five years ago or something like that. Uh, obviously, like Zamarin had helped to reload even before that, uh, I suppose. So I was not the first one, but still similar idea. So the original implementation was that I will use the abdomens because at the time abdomens were the way to do it. So you load something into the abdomen uh, and then you unload the abdomen, which unloads the assembly and you can load it again. Simple stuff. Uh, the problem is that if you are marshalling something between the abdomens, you are deriving from marshal by ref object um, and you are dealing with marshalling between the abdomens, which is very, very, very slow. Uh, so I eventually uh, ditched the abdomens and different loader optimizations and so on, as you saw see in this code. And I create the simple hack. Instead of loading the assembly from the disk, from the file, I first load the assembly into the byte array and then load the assembly from this byte array. At this point, .NET has no idea where the real DLL is, so it's not locking it on the disk. So you can actually replace this DLL and then just reload the, the Firebird server. It's not still hot reloading as it was. There is no unloading and, and something like that, but it was a hack that worked uh, initially. Luckily, uh, when the .NET Core came out, uh, I dropped abdomains or .NET Core dropped abdomains. So I even dropped this, uh, this idea, which is really, really nice because the abdomains were huge, huge uh, pain in the ass. But if you need to load something into your application and not lock it on the disk so it can be deleted or something, this idea of instead of loading it from the disk, first load it into the byte array and then use assembly.load and use the byte array is a quick fix to do this one. And if it's something really minor in your application, then it's a great way to do it. Then obviously, instead of the reflection, I needed to have a faster, faster calls. So I created something uh, that I call delegate builder that basically allows you to call methods dynamically uh, and not slowly as with the reflection. You have basically two ways to build this delegate using the expressions and using the reflection emit. The expressions are a little bit more straightforward, but also um, somewhat limited because uh, all the features that are there kind of ended up in um, .NET 4-ish, uh, sorry, uh, C sharp four ish era. So all the new constructs that we know from C sharp seven and eight and nine and even 10 um, might not be available to you uh, because uh, it's not available there, but still it's pretty easy. Let me show you. So what I have here is a simple way to call um, a, a function dynamically. So basically I have a string that, 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 that that's given to me by I don't know, something else. Uh, in my case, it's the delegate helper that says hello, and in my case, .netos. So I will just get the type, call get method, and then invoke the normal reflection stuff that you probably know. But if you would try to call this, I don't know, 10,000 times, uh, you would see that it's pretty slow. It's kind of like a dynamic invocation with this invoke. <clears throat> So the next thing uh, you can do is build this delegate. So that's what I have here. That's really the code from that day, that, that, that time. Uh, now it's a little bit different, a little bit better. I will be talking about it later. But anyway, what I actually do is build the, the expression call for this particular method. I'm still using the same stuff as the reflection, like the object uh, array as the input parameters an object, in my case, object array as the as the return parameters that's still uh, still the same. Uh, but at least uh, I have a delegate that I can like cache and call. And on this expression class, you will find a bunch of constructs that you know from the C sharp. So if I do expression dot, uh, there is a, a add assign, there is an array, uh, array access, array index, uh, and so on. So, on. so for example, here you can see I'm using the convert to convert the data types. I'm using the call to call the function. And I even have the constant to have a constant because I'm calling the array index. So like index one, index two, index three, and so on and so on. And this is a little bit faster. It still works the same way. So if I run it, it will say hello.netos and we will not see any difference in this simple scenario. But as I said, you can call it 10,000 times and you will see. Uh, the difference. Uh, and I will share this code with you as well. And you might say, why would I call it 10,000 times or, or a million times? It's pretty easy. If I'm creating a plugin that allows you to execute a function as part of the select or, up, or update or insert or something like that, you mostly select, you might have a table with 10 million records. 
And if you do some var filtering or some grouping or something like that in SQL, mm, then it will be called 10 million times. So every millisecond, microsecond, every nanosecond really, really counts because I don't know, like one nanosecond times 10 million is pretty significant difference in time. So that was the first one. I will show you the next one uh, at the end. And then I realized that I'm comparing uh, types on different places on the plugin. Basically type on the left side equals equals type of something else. Uh, and always getting the type of was kind of expensive. And also comparing these types was kind of expensive. So I first started, hey, I can cache uh, the type instance. So for example, for the int, I had a type int property or, or field that I can actually use. Well, it was kind of better, uh, but then I realized I don't need to compare the full type. I'm not interested in, in, in full type. I just want to know, hey, is this integer? Is this is this double? Is this long? Is this varchar from the database? And is it the same? Is it compatible with what the user created as the function? So the lesson learned is that if you are comparing the types, the type with uppercase T, with the type type, it's kind of slow. Again, usually not something you would care about. Um, but if you do a lot of comparisons, it's probably easier uh, to do either some caching of the result or of the types, or even go a little bit further. And if you can uh, create an enum or some kind of distinct variables that you can compare and are simple types, like in my case, byte. So I can compare just, just numbers and computers are great in comparing numbers uh, while comparing instances of types and, uh, and the equality is a little bit, a uh, little bit different. So uh, then um, I realized that uh, for my caching of the delegates and the assemblies, I'm using uh, two concurrent dictionaries. And my usage is mostly reading and writing. Sorry, my, my usage is mostly reading a little bit of writing. Uh, and by my measurements, uh, it was easier for me to have a, just a simple dictionary, not the concurrent one, and the reader writer lock slim because I'm reading a lot and writing only a bit. Uh, but fair to say, I still need to revisit this one for the .NET Core because I know the guys in the runtime and, and, and base class library did a great job in last couple of versions of .NET Core and .NET improving not only dictionary, but all collections and, and JIT is a, a little bit smarter about it. So what was working in .NET, I don't know, it was like 4.7 something, uh, might not hold here. But what I want to say is that if you have a concurrent dictionary and you have some um, unbalanced uh, operations, like really, really huge amount of reading and uh, a, a only bit of writing, you might be easier to just use the normal dictionary where the lookup will be probably faster and just use your own locking with reader writer lock slim or any other type. Then finally, I migrated into the .NET Core because the .NET Core finally supported C++ CLI or maybe the other way around C++ CLI supported .NET Core. That was um, like December 2019, 2020. So it's not that long time ago. I was finally able to um, like forget about the application domains and use the assembly load context which is a, a chapter that we will visit in a, in a minute. Uh, then you will find uh, assemblies that are called it just works and it really kind of just works like 99% of the time you realize you need your own runtime config and other stuff and you need to deal with the loading. You will see that in a minute. So immediately after I uh, migrated to the .NET Core, somebody came to me and said, hey, uh, because we can have like the self-contained uh, applications, would it be possible to, to distribute .NET as part of the plugin? Uh, which is what it is there. If I go into my VM and check the firewall installation folder and plugins and the FBN external engine, there is a .NET folder that actually contains the .NET Core in today .NET Core 3.1. And I said, well, that actually makes sense. Uh, so I started figuring out how to distribute basically a DLL, DLL that's loaded into unmanaged process uh, through C++ CLI uh, with the, with, together with the .NET Core. Uh, and uh, yes, you can manually load the .NET Core, start hosting it and so on and so on. But at that point, I wasn't sure I want to do that. I want to spend time on it. But I was lucky 
to find two special environment variables called .NET underscore root and the same for x86. That basically allows you to specify from where to load the .NET. The only problem I had was that uh, I had C++ CLI. So whenever this assembly was loaded, the .NET was also loaded. So it was a little bit too late to set the environment variable. So what I had to do is create something uh, that I call shim. It's basically a native DLL where I set these environment variables for the process and then load the C++ CLI DLL. That's what you see in the installation. There is this uh, plugin shim file and the plugin itself is here. So there I set these two environment variables and up we go. Then at some point, uh, after debugging some issue for a customer, I get a memory dump and I saw that the .NET was loaded from some random location, not from random, it was from C program files. And I was like, why is it loaded from C program files? By the way, that was the issue, there was some versioning issue and so on. So I started uh, digging into it and then I realized that even if you have the .NET root, uh, the loader will still try to look up uh, from some well-known location like C program files .NET and so on and so on. Um, and I was like, ah, oh, God damn it, that's gonna hurt and I don't know what to do and d -d 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 -d. And eventually, I again, luckily find an environment variable called .NET multi-level lookup. If you set it to false or actually to zero, uh, the .NET loader will not actually do lookups in these well-known folders, but load it only from the .NET root you specified. Boom, win, and I can easily distribute this uh, with, uh, with my plugin and it's loaded only from this, um, this directory with expected version of, um, of uh, the .NET. And after this, it was uh, about writing a specific code. So all the pieces I will be discussing to now are about a specific code. So first I started doing something with the, I call it message with the with basically a uh, piece of uh, memory that the Firebird is providing to me uh, and storing the metadata about where is the value, where is the offset, what's the type and so on and so on. And I quickly realized that sometimes, and again, with the next versions, they are improving the JIT. Sometimes it's a little bit easier to use unsigned integer because for example, the offset uh, in my case is never gonna be negative. And some comparisons, some computations with the unsigned integers are uh, better, the, the assembly code is better because it does not have to deal with the, with the uh, sign. So I use the unsigned integers. So if you are really performance sensitive, you can try switching from integers to unsigned integers uh, for like greater than uh, equals and so on uh, and uh, check what the assembly looks like and you might have a small performance benefit. Then I started switching uh, into some specific code which means if you look into first line, uh, I am actually saying, hey, if the value is true, write minus one and then uh, and otherwise write zero. Before it was there, convert to in 16, which is fine. Um, but sometimes I saw that the convert to in 16 was not properly expanded into the simple code. That's the same as the last example there that's actually reading something. So instead of convert to Boolean, I'm now doing not equals zero. Yes, sometimes it's the same, sometimes not, depends on what the JIT uh, thinks is useful, but if I put the not equals zero, it, uh, it absolutely is just a piece of assembly instruction saying, hey, if it's not zero, do this. And then finally, something, uh, because we are here about the performance, you probably know, the JIT uh, generates specific code for a generic method with structures, because structures are specific, reference types are just a pointer. So that's, that's always one version. So I started switching inside my code from the function you can see below the get value that basically takes whatever uh, into uh, two versions for reference types that I eventually drop because I don't have any reference types being read from the memory uh, into a value types where I have the constant where t is struct, is structure. That way the JIT can generate a specific code for my case and I don't have to deal with like, hey, if it's an integer, it's slightly different size than uh, the long and so on and so on. So again, that gave me a little bit of speed up because of the specific code. Uh, then I decided, well, the delegates I'm building are still using the object arrays 
and so on, which kind of uh, kind of sucks because I need to build the object and I put values into it uh, and uh, and pass it. So there's some extra allocations and extra operations, and I need to make it as fast as possible. So instead of basically creating a delegate that simulates what the reflection is doing, now I'm creating a delegate that's actually uh, creating a specific code to call this particular function. So in my arguments class that we saw before, I have a method that's called get value. You can see it. Uh, uh, you can see it. You can see it here. And the get value basically takes an index and the type of the argument you are expecting. So I can say, hey, give me the fifth argument and I expect an integer. <clears throat> and the get value is try to get the fifth argument and give me it as an integer uh, if possible. So instead of getting everything from the object array, I'm now uh, generating the expression specifically to call this function. So what I want to say is that once you step into generating a specific code, you don't need to only mimic what the reflection does. You can go even further and generate a specific cost, specific indexes um, and, and specific conversions depending on what you actually need. It does not have to be, hey, reflection is doing this, is slow, switch into generated code, but generate the same what the reflection does. No, you can now start working with specific types and specific calls and so on. And because I also migrated to .NET uh, Core, I finally could use the unsafe class, the new unsafe class, Memory Marshall. Uh, I switched into the void pointers instead of in, in, in PTR class uh, and, and other, other pieces. Uh, so for example, as I'm reading from this block of memory that Firebird is providing to me, I have this specific read function that basically I say, hey, this is the pointer where it starts and this is the offset. And thanks to the unsafe class, which is really unsafe, uh, I can really have a method like this one, read an unsafe add that results in, I don't know, like three or four assembly instructions. So it's as good as it gets, at least I think, um, which is really, really nice to um, basically still write a C-sharp code with a nice syntax and so on and Visual Studio and basically have at the end just a bunch of assembly instructions that are as good as you would write it manually. You can take this one and put it into the Sharp Lab and see that it that it's really just a piece of three or four assembly instructions. Then I eventually edit um, uh, just a structure again, the the enforcement on the t on the T because I'm actually reading from memory just something that's like integer double and so on or byte array and then converting it into string or something like that. It's not that I'm reading. Um, a string, for example, because the representation of string or varchar in Firebird is completely different of the uh, of the uh, string in the .NET itself. And then I realized if I have this message metadata class where I have all the metadata about the uh, about the piece of memory that I'm getting, I mean this one. And every time I want to know the type or the length or the value offset, I need to index into the array multiple times. Yes, indexing into the array is fast, but it's not fast enough if you are executing something 10 million times, or if you are doing three indexes into an array, it's always worse than doing just one. So what I started doing is creating this read-only structure called value, where I have all these values for the different arguments, and then indexing only once and getting this value and not only indexing once, that's the second to last line on this slide here, but also using the ref, uh, using the ref returns, so I'm actually not copying these structures. So now, no matter how often times I need the value and null and type and so on, I'm indexing only once into this array, which is better than indexing twice or multiple times. I'm getting the ref return, for the value, and whenever I'm passing uh, stuff uh, into the method that's using the message meta or actually the value itself, I'm using the in modifier that's on the next next slide. So if you are writing code that's using a lot of read-only structures, make sure that sorry that's using a lot of structures, make sure that you can use the read-only structures that you can use the ref returns. Uh, that's uh, here on the bottom, or that you can use the in modifier. Preferably everything 
together because then you have a, a really nice performant code that's not copying the structures left and right. So that's really, really nice code. And obviously, if you think about the performance, then even the indexing into the array kind of sucks if you are doing it multiple times into a different arrays. So doing it once makes absolute sense. Then again, some crazy idea like minimizing indexing into an array uh, was that I figured out that I have actually um, the C++ CLI that's generating a lot of code uh, into the into the function, uh, even though it's not a, a managed function, it's purely C++ function. And I realized, hey, there is a pragma called managed and on off or or push off and pop, basically turning on and off the managed stuff uh, in the in the code. Uh, as far as I understand, usually the C++ compiler is doing this uh, itself, but on the class level. But for me, I have some calls from the Firebird, again, millions and millions of times, where the Firebird is actually, uh, where the Firebird is actually calling, um, calling into this function. And if it's a managed function, then it's a little bit uh, more code than it has to be. Like for example, this one is just single, uh, single string copy basically. So uh, why would I have this code? So I spent uh, one afternoon or something like that going through the C++ code and manually going to do managed off, managed on, managed off, managed on, where it was possible. <clears throat> and even sometimes I took function that uh, had some like native part and some managed part and removed the native from that one and have the managed off on that function and just call it from, from the different one. Uh, so it was... Um, it was extracted away and it could be with the managed off. Uh, probably crazy uh, idea to manually do this one, one by one. But again, I'm hunting all these 1% of the performance. Then, then I realized, or actually I knew it for quite some time, that the uh, dictionary lookups are somewhat expensive. If you ask anybody like, hey, I have some value that I need to often time find in the list or array, what should I do? Everybody will tell, hey, use the dictionary because the lookups in the dictionary will be fast. That's that's the reason behind the hash table, right? But again, if you are doing it multiple times, uh, then these lookups are kind of, uh, kind of slow. So I decided to ditch the dictionary completely, not using the dictionary uh, because the lookups are expensive and basically split the generation from the invocation. Uh, there's a little bit of internal stuff, but basically on the first execution, I will generate everything and return a new class. This is an abstract class that's there uh, for invocation. And then I will reuse just this invocation. So instead of having lookup in the dictionary to get this invocation, I have just a pointer in the memory and it sits in the memory. So what I want to say is dictionary lookups are really, really nice. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that, but if you are hunting really, really a nanoseconds, the dictionary will be always slow than holding a pointer into something in the memory or generating hard-coded like switch statement, like switch something, return this, switch something, return this, because the code itself will be faster than like dynamically looking up something in a data structure. If the data structure is addresses in your memory, it's as fast as it could be. Um, then I realized, okay, I'm creating a lot of instances of different classes. For example, this arguments class that we saw before, uh, but the class itself is completely useless. It's just a projection of where is the memory and what's the metadata. And the metadata is always the same, given the same, uh, same invocation. So instead of creating a new class all the time and then throwing it away and garbage collector dealing with it. And I'm not saying that the garbage collector is wrong or slow or something like that. No, garbage collector is great. If you can rely on garbage collector, do it. It's fine. It's doing its job. It's a, it's a crazy fast, crazy, nice piece of technology. But again, if I can decide between creating 1 million instances and then later garbage collector dealing with them or creating one and just like shifting the view in the memory, depending on where the data is, then I would do this one. So I created this arguments class or modified this arguments class with the method I call it use, where I will say, hey, this is the pointer and some other arguments and just read this from the pointer. 
just take the metadata and if I say, hey, I need a third argument, look up in the metadata, do some magic with the pointers and it's there. And for the next invocation where the Firebird is providing me different one, I will use the same class, same instance, and just shift it into some other place in the memory and read from there. Again, reducing the allocations. Allocations, uh, the, the allocations itself are not that, that a problem. Uh, the way the memory works in .NET is really, really interesting. And um, you are paying the price with the garbage collector later. So allocating is not a problem, but obviously garbage collector needs to deal with it and we're allocating something. And uh, obviously if I can make my plugin uh, less memory hungry, then it makes absolute sense. Eventually, a couple of weeks ago, I switched to Reflection Emit, uh, mostly uh, to control the EL generation exactly from the expressions, and also mostly because the expressions are great. But if you compare the expressions and Reflection Emit, you can say almost a 1% performance difference, maybe a little bit less. But still, I'm hunting even the one performance because one nanosecond or two nanoseconds times 10 million is a hell of a hell of a difference. So I switched to reflection emit and generating it uh, slightly better. This is an example of what I'm actually generating. Uh, basically putting um, the the EL the same one the same one that the compiler would be uh, into the memory and then uh, using it and JIT generating the code for me. Um, my idea is that eventually I will not be limited by what the expressions can do but I would be able to use even some, some constructs that are not available in the c -sharp to generate a better code or fiddle with some uh, pointers and indexes and, uh, and opcodes and so on. Uh, so that's what I'm actually doing. The, the benefit of uh, expression trees, and I would use expression trees basically every time there's only a few uh, ways where the reflection of it makes sense. So the benefit of expressions is that it's very, very difficult to create invalid code. With reflection emit, you can create invalid code like this. It's really like one mistake, one line forgotten or something. And the JIT will tell you, hey, this is an invalid code. I don't know what to, what you are trying to do. Like just, this is an exception and, and go home. So it's really, really difficult to make it absolutely correct. But again, 1% uh, makes sense. Eventually I uh, revisited the hot reload. Um, mostly because the unloading is a little bit difficult. It's not absolutely deterministic. Then you have the dependencies and so on. Um, and uh, the nail in the coffin was uh, that I realized, I, I figured out that if you have a static values like caches or static constructors, they will be called kind of in a weird way, depending on into which assembly load context uh, it is loaded and at what time in and uh, in what point in time it's loaded. I wrote recently two blog posts that are linked here and you can read them uh, in kind of a deep dive session. Uh, but basically the assembly load context looks like you are loading the assembly into the same process. It's not like isolated abdomain, but there is still a little bit of isolation related to static values and static constructors. And that makes it really difficult to manage it from like developer's point of view. Uh, so I decided to throw it away, uh, at least for the moment, uh, because it might have a weird behavior uh, depending on what was loaded where and the developers might be uh, confusing, confused. And I also said, hey, are the restart, are the fiber restarts really that problematic? And is my plugin having hot reload going to solve it? Probably not, at least that's what I'm saying right now. Um, and as I said, uh, I revisited it recently. So when I will get feedback from customers, I will know better. But I think the restarts are not that problematic. And if they are problematic, then you should do something else than just rely on this plugin anyway. So we are kind of out of time. So what's next? I showed you a few crazy stuff, like instead of indexing five times, I'm indexing one time into an array and so on. Uh, so more performance. I'm always looking into more performance. I like it uh, when I have time and when I'm working on it, as I said, it's not my full-time job. Uh, I'm trying to understand like, what's this happening? Why is it happening? Can I remove it? Can I make it uh, faster? 
uh, maybe I need to rewrite something like the expressions into Emit and so on. So more performance, that's the next. Uh, what I'm playing with now is, can I place some casting around the, around the code uh, using the unsafe class? Is it worth it? Is it going to give me some extra benefit? Because the normal cast and the unsafe cast is a completely different beast. The problem is that there's only a few places where I'm casting something and is it, is it safe to do it? Do I have enough protection in front of it so I know that the cast will always succeed and so on? Then I'm thinking with the reflection emit, with this one, uh, can I create a fully generic pipeline? If you look into the signature of this bulk build function method delegate, it returns, among other stuff, the object that I need to later cast into something and put it into the fiber memory. Can I, and does it make sense, uh, create a fully generic pipeline, meaning if the function returns integer, then I will be generating a delegate that actually returns an integer as well. Does it make sense? Will I hit any boxing later on or something like that? Then I'm thinking about the manual .NET hosting and loading. So not relying on C++ CLI and my shim itself. The reason is that maybe I can create something a little bit easier for marshalling calls and the data and not relying on C++ CLI where, where I don't have to. And also I'm considering uh, also the Linux version where obviously the C++ CLI does not exist at least at the moment. And finally, as the last step, I'm thinking that would be kind of crazy, maybe just a side project or something. Wouldn't it be cool? It's actually not my idea. Somebody else pitched it to me, but I like it. Wouldn't it be cool if you could take the C sharp code, like the text and put it into the database. And when you execute the function, the plugin would take the source, build it, compile it and run it. And as long as you don't change the source code, the compiled version will be used. It looks really interesting. It looks really crazy. Um, I don't know whether it's worth it because there is a, something nice that you can develop it in Visual Studio and compile it and debug it and so on. But at the end of the day, it's also kind of easy to just select the source code, copy paste it into the database, save it, and you don't have to copy any DLLs into the server. If you copy the database, you basically copy it also the logic that's inside the database, the same way as your procedural SQL is already in the database. It's not outside, um, you know, so it's really interesting, but also I'm thinking this is stupid. Why would you write something in a Visual Studio, compile it, debug it, and then just take the source code and put it back? That, that sounds stupid, but I don't know. It's really interesting. And it seems to be a really interesting project to, to try like, can I dynamically compile it and dynamically load it and dynamically execute it? And what will be the performance and how can I do it? And so on and so on and so on. Really interesting. So that's my last slide. I will ah, a little bit stretch my time and I will show you what the uh, performance looks like at the moment. So yeah, I'm in the release. Uh, so I will run the whole test suite, but it's really uh, a really uh, short one. And as the last part of my test suite, I'm also testing the performance and comparing it with procedural SQL inside of Firebird. Obviously the procedural SQL is kind of winning, uh, but for example, for the fetching for, for, from stored procedure, uh, it's only 1.09 um, times slower. Uh, so basically you can see 42 versus 46 uh, milliseconds. That's almost the same. Executing the function, uh, at the moment takes me 1.11 microseconds. That's still order of magnitude slower than calling a normal function in the .NET. But I still need to take the data from Firebird, put it into the .NET, execute the function, get the result back and put it into the Firebird, which I think for one microsecond is um, kind of okay. Although I would like to make it always faster, at least get into hundreds of nanoseconds uh, area that would be really, really nice. With that, I'm not going to use any more of your time. I hope you learned something. I hope you find it interesting and a little bit crazy uh, what I'm doing and what I plan to do. If you have any questions, send them in the chat and uh, hope to see you next time and hope you are enjoying the rest of the conference. Bye.